Day 22, in defense of the disillusioned. Sometimes your life doesn't work out how you planned it, line by line, promise by promise, heartbeat by heartbeat. Sometimes the vision that dances in your head like sugar plums and happily ever afters and smart, successful, contributing citizens called your children turns into a puzzle you can't solve or a missing piece you can't find under the cushions or that thud, thud in your chest. A persistent, something's not right, something's not right that clicks with your heels and follows you into the grocery store. Sometimes the ideal shatters through no obvious fault of your own, though you wish it were, so you could fix it naturally, like you fix everything else. Someone's implacable will thwarts, harms, crushes yours, or finds happiness in someone else's. Sometimes your body succumbs to germs or cells that won't stop growing, and they take over your organs and ruin your chance to do all you had planned, for forever and a day. Sometimes they live in the body of your dearest friend, deepest love, or most beloved child. Sometimes, no matter how diligently you protect them and worry on their behalf, your children stumble into tragedy or crime unimagined and never planned. Sometimes one of your precious kids is violated horribly while you were pinning new kitchen photos to Pinterest and having devotions. The disillusioned suffer twice and three times. Not only do they face the excruciating pain of tragedy at night and in the middle of the afternoon, they also face the natural tendency of those we love most to assign blame for the failure. Pain, loss, divorce, disease, Violation to the not yet suffering, these are as contagious as mumps or the common cold. All who are not afflicted look for the cause so they can stay safe and not make the horrible mistakes you've made. You didn't do it right. You didn't pray enough, go to therapy, read the right books, get the right doctors, eat the right foods, follow the right advice, use these steps, take this tone, Follow this practice, behave in that way, honor this code, or believe this set of precepts. The list goes on endlessly, and no protestations of how much you tried calms the advice givers. They want to believe they have identified the one or ten key ingredients that you missed that they can embrace to avoid your fate. They don't try to figure out your failings to be cruel know that. It's desperation to avoid your tragedy. But you can face this disillusionment, this failed bargain with God or life or nature, differently because these awful conditions are real for you. Not theory, not avoidable. They're here now waiting for you to deal with them, not with what you might have done or could have done differently. Disillusionment is the beginning of new chances, a chance to find a new way to live or love for however long you have. It's the beginning of asking real questions rather than seeking ironclad answers. It's your chance to take some risks, to explore some forbidden secret ideals you had overlooked before in your safety. It's your chance to have an authentic, self-created journey rather than the second-hand one the books and leaders tell you to have. It's a chance to pay attention to people as they actually are rather than as you wish them to be. And it's often your first real chance to ask yourself, who am I? And then another better chance to become that person in a whole new way. I love talking with disillusioned homeschoolers because they are closer to being good at educating their kids than the ones who think they have a system that works. If homeschooling has failed you somehow, if your marriage is not working, if your children are reacting against you and you don't know how to bring them near, 
you are much closer to having a life built on a foundation of truth and reality than you've ever been. Hold on. Face life on its terms, the pain, the disillusionment. Don't judge your life. Pay attention to it. Let it tell you what you need to know. And by all means, find others who've walked similar journeys. They will have wisdom to share. You are not bad, wrong, or a failure. You are not foolish, uncommitted, or selfish. You are human. Everyone, by the time they get to 50 or 60, will have experienced the humbling realization of being time-bound and planet-dwelling among germs and people. That you would attempt, for example, to be married till death, to have children, to home educate, and to love your life despite cancer is brave and optimistic. Draw on those resources as you face your disillusionment squarely. Then see what happens. You might be amazed. Quote of the day. I feel like I have experienced this in so many ways, Julie. Thanks for articulating it so beautifully. Anne Corcoran. Sustaining thought. Life delivers its blows no matter what we do, but it also brings inexplicable blessings no matter what we do. Embrace both. <sighs> so, when we talk about how to support one another, one of the first ways you can do that for your friend who's going through pain is to be an includer, to not exclude someone because her life didn't turn out or because the ideals you both shared are no longer her ideals. It takes real courage to sustain a friendship when the friend you were walking on the path with diverges, goes a different way. And it's really hard in homeschooling because we seek shelter from the larger world that maybe doesn't understand or judges homeschooling. We seek each other as a source of support and comfort. But within that community, it is so tempting to sort of bifurcate into these even smaller pods, smaller groups. And when we do that, we are excluding people who have a different experience. And the trouble is this, we are all going to eventually need someone to stand by our sides when crisis comes for us. So if you can be the kind of person who's got that bigger open heart and can recognize that the pain someone else is living, even though it's not yours, that person deserves an ally and a friend and someone who will listen, you don't have to agree. If your friend decides to get a divorce, you don't have to say divorce is the thing I wish all people would get to at least hear the story of why her divorce is happening. It isn't necessary to render judgment when people are living through traumatic experiences. As they're going through them, they can't even tell you what they would or could have done differently. All they know is this is where they are now. And maybe five or 10 years from now, they could look back and say, I really shouldn't have fill in the blank. But when you're in it, it's not valuable. All you can do is live into the truth of your current experience. One of the things that I found so frustrating as a home educator is that I kept feeling like I was coming into an understanding of education too late to be a part of the community, to be a meaningful member. You know what I'm saying? Like, to really be a true unschooler, it seemed like I really needed to start when my kids were five. I couldn't sort of join midstream because I had missed out on all these years leading up to that point. Therefore, I wasn't really truly in that story. I was always peripheral. I felt that way when I was exploring Charlotte Mason. I felt that way when I was doing more traditional home education. Each time I made a pivot or a shift, there was this sense of, 
oh, why haven't I figured it out yet? Well, that's exactly the same sense that a lot of us have about our actual lives. Why didn't I figure out that we shouldn't have moved across country? Why didn't I figure out that I shouldn't have married that man? Why didn't I get that appointment with that doctor a year earlier so that she wouldn't die? These are self-recriminations that we can only have at the point that we're embroiled in the horrible, hard, painful thing. You cannot take a time machine and go backwards and undo the whole collection of circumstances that led you to this pivotal moment in your life. So the one thing that we can do is support one another when that moment comes for us. And it comes. Crazy things come. When I was young, 24 years old, I was living in the States for a summer. We were on furlough from living abroad. And one of the gals who was in my church was also my age. And uh, I think I've shared this story before. And she was buying a wedding shower gift, I believe it was, in the Pasadena Mall. When two young men came up behind her with a gun, they marched her out to her car. She was raped. And then she was killed. Um, I'm going to save details because I realize some kids may be listening. And, of course, I know that she, because of her own personal faith, would have been begging God for that not to have occurred to her while it was going on. And her husband had to grapple with, how could my new bride be violently killed and taken from me? And those two young men were caught the next day, and they are still in prison to this day. Stuff happens. We don't have control over what happens to us. We don't have control even over all of our choices. We are living in an environment. We are living in communities. We don't have the ability to prevent bad things from happening in our lives. So even if there are some things that we can try to prevent, and that's part of the reason some people homeschool, keep their kids home, away from possible shootings in school, away from possible drug addiction, away from possible violation. Well, I know the violations that have happened in homes, in families near to me and dear to me, where there has been sibling violation that should not have happened in the home. Here you are protecting your children from school, and it's going on under your nose between siblings. That's a horrifying discovery. And it's not helpful to have your friend down the street suddenly not want to be your friend now because you failed at homeschooling. The things that happen to human beings outside of homeschool happen to human beings who homeschool. And it's really important that we grapple with that. If we are living with the illusion that somehow we can protect ourselves from ever suffering, we will quickly be disappointed. I remember my aunt saying, my Aunt June, who is a professor of religion for 43 years, and her specialty was ethics. And she said to me once, idealists are shocked a lot in life. Idealists are shocked a lot in life. You are an idealist if you homeschool. On some level, you have sus subscribed to this ideal of what education can be. So you know what that means? <laughs> You're going to be shocked a lot <laughs> in life. Kids who don't cooperate, a child who suddenly has a learning disability that you didn't anticipate, uh, some kind of move internationally or across the state line, or the discovery that whatever strategy you were using did not achieve the result you were hoping for. These are normal consequences of taking on the responsibility of educating your young. Is it possible to educate your young? Yes. Is it possible to make a safe passage through life without tragedy? No. No. We all know it's not. Now, we work every day to mitigate tragedy. We put our children in car seats. We wear seat belts. We eat our vegetables, <laughs> we get doctor appointments, we get vaccines, or we choose not to for the same reason that people get vaccines, <laughs> to protect ourselves. 
We make choices every day, and even some of those choices backfire. One of my dear friends from years and years ago, who was a homeschooler, experienced tragedy with her son when she was doing something preventative to protect him. What do we do with that information? Should she feel like a terrible mother? She was doing what she thought was the right thing to do, and it resulted in tragedy. We used to have a joke in my family that the reason I never wanted a swimming pool in my backyard is that I knew I wasn't a good enough mother to supervise children and a swimming pool in that kind of proximity 365 days a year. And so what did I do? I robbed my children of having a swimming pool. <laughs> I just never wanted to take that risk. I didn't want to live with that feeling of, oh my gosh, I wasn't on watch in a good enough way, you know, that I hadn't done a good enough job of supervising. But everybody's trying to protect their children from tragedy by either supervising extra, extra, or pretending not to supervise, and still bad things happen. Kids still get in car accidents. They still wind up in places that you didn't ever want them to go. So, disillusionment is a component of growing older, and it's a component of dealing with reality. And the best way to navigate disillusionment is to stay honest about what's real, to not explain it away, to not blame it away, to not create some kind of rubric for whether or not someone brought tragedy on themselves. Jen writes, sometimes you meet your fate on the road you took to avoid it. That's an amazing quote. That's absolutely the truth. So while we're in this soup, how do we get out of it? How do you just get out of this bubble of panic and the need to self-protect? This idea that somehow we can filter all television messages, we can control all inputs, we can manage all outcomes. I mean, we know we can't. I mean, goodness, people's houses burn down, they're wiped out by tornadoes. Someone loses a job and you have to foreclose your beautiful home. Sometimes the market and nature and germs and disease come for you and you don't have any control over that. It throws, you know, a bomb into your life. Some babies you think are going to be born with absolutely ordinary intelligence and physical well-being, and they're born and inexplicably 20 years later, that child is still completely brain injured, and there's no explanation. That's one of my best friends from high school. That is her condition. Her son is 20 just a couple days ago. And there is literally no diagnosis he has ever had. And the pregnancy was perfectly normal. We can't explain life. But we can do what my friend has done. She wholeheartedly embraced that task that was set before her. And she found community. And she reached out to her friends like me and her other friends from high school and college. And we've been there for her. And she's had a way through the dark tunnel because she isn't alone and nobody blamed her. No one said, well, you should have, you know, walked four miles a day while you were pregnant. Can you imagine? People do stuff like that. So you get to high school and you've got a child who is still unsuccessful in math and you feel like you've thrown everything in the kitchen sink at this math experience and they're still not successful, and you have four kids, and three of them are fine in math, and you still have one who isn't, does that mean you did something terribly, horribly, utterly wrong? No. What it means is you have a problem to solve, and you're just going to keep coming at it, doing the best you can, looking for solutions. You are not the billboard for homeschool. It is not your job to prove that homeschool is successful in all cases, all subjects, all the time. That isn't your job. Your job is to look after your kids, to do the best you can by them. Johanna has a fantastic quote that I will never forget. <laughs> Liam was getting ready to go to Europe, and he was 19, 18, I guess, 18 at the time. He finished high school, he spent a year saving money working, and then he decided to go visit his brother Jacob, who was living abroad. 
They were going to travel together for two weeks. Then Liam was going to get on a bus to go from Western Europe all the way to Slovakia, no, Croatia, by himself to visit a gaming friend that he had met online. Okay, does this not sound like a dangerous thing to do? But we're travelers, and I've met lots of my friends from online. How could I just assume that this was going to be a bad situation? We did all the things you're supposed to do to verify that this was a real human being, and I came to agree that he was, but we don't know him, and Liam really wanted to take this trip. So we organized it. We did everything we could to make sure he could connect with us when he wanted to, and he got on this bus, and I knew he was going to be out of communication with me for like 36 hours. And I knew during that time he would be on a bus by himself riding in the middle of the night to, to Croatia alone <laughs> to meet some guy that I've never met in person who's going to pick him up and take him to his house. And those were scary 36 hours for me. But even more so when I got the email the next day from Liam saying how terrified he was in the middle of the night. But it all worked out. I mean, there were a couple glitches. He almost missed his bus when he got off to use the bathroom and almost didn't get back on time, like, right? Like the stuff that happens when you travel. But he got back on the bus and he made it and the guy picked him up and he turned out to be a perfectly pleasant human being. But here's what got Liam through the scary moment in the middle of the night. Johanna had said this, my wise traveling live abroad daughter. She said, when you have a problem, what are you gonna do? curl up in a ball and die. <laughs> she says, when you have a problem, you do the next thing to address the problem. And you know, curling up in a ball and dying is not an option. When you're a mother and you have children and you are facing challenges, you are not going to take the fetal position and check out, I know you. And if that is how you're feeling, like getting in the fetal position and checking out? Well, now someone needs to take care of you because now you are at the crisis level and there are good people on this planet who want to save you from your own terror, okay? So either you're going to recognize that here's a problem, I'm going to meet it and I'm going to keep meeting it until we figure it out, or you're going to get help for you. And those are the only two options. The other option, which is wishing it away or processing why it happened or blaming yourself or shaming somebody else, those don't work. They don't help and they don't get you where you want to go. So you either wave the white flag and say, hey, this is serious. I need inpatient treatment or I need therapy or I need antidepressants or I need someone to care for me because I'm falling apart or because then that's the crisis or here is this problem and it is meeting me right where I live and I need to solve it. I'm going to find partners, I'm going to find resources and I will not curl up into a ball and die. And that's it. And then you just keep going at it the best you can. And you take the results you get. You take the results you get. Because no matter how much we wish we could control how it all turns out, it's going to turn out how it turns out. Think back to your own parents and when you were growing up. Some of you know that you are doing things your parents never anticipated you would do. You know those parents who are hard on you because you breastfed and you decided to foster three children and have eight? <laughs> there are a lot of parents who aren't fans of that. You know those parents who don't think homeschooling is a great idea? You've got some parents and in-laws like that, right? You aren't all doing the imagined future that your parents thought of when they held you in their arms. And that's true for your kids too. So your obligation isn't to ensure that they turn out a specific way. It is to keep taking out the roadblocks that allow them to discover who they are. And if one of them gets leukemia, that's a pretty big roadblock. It is okay to go all in on battling leukemia. 
And is that going to create havoc in your homeschool for the rest of your kids? Yes, it is. And now you have choices to make. Do the other kids go to school? Do you continue to homeschool and keep everyone together? And both of those have costs. And both of those are good options. And you're going to work that out. And sometimes you're going to go down this path and then you're going to be like, whoops. And then you'll back it up and you're going to go down this path. That is what it means to be human. So let me conclude with this. If you're disillusioned today, I hear you. I hear you. I've been there. I will be there again. And all of us care. Everybody in this group right here today cares. You wouldn't still be on this broadcast if you didn't care. So reach out, find your people, and hang out with those who care about you and what you're going through, no matter how scandalized they might be when you tell them what it is. Okay? And do the next thing. Don't curl up into a ball and die. I'm counting on you. Do the next thing. Okay? All right. Any questions? Carol's feeling disillusioned a lot lately. I will say this. Carol, you made me think of something. Sometimes we are having disillusionment as a hangover. And what I mean by that is you may have had trauma either from your childhood, um, from somebody who was supposed to care for you and mistreated you, from your own experience of school, maybe even currently, maybe from a bad relationship. When you have suffered profoundly in any context, there's a hangover effect. The desire to live differently is so profound that sometimes we are clinging to the ideal thinking it will heal us of our pain. But ideals have a way of making the pain bigger. When we cling to the ideal, for example, let me just use myself. My parents are divorced. So guess what I was never going to be? Ever. Divorced. So what did I do? I clung to the ideal of marriage. And I can't even say that I stayed too long or anything like that because I stayed as long as I stayed and we did marriage as best we could under those conditions. But the ideal amplified all of the pain and the dysfunction that I brought with me. And instead of dealing with the real, there's a temptation to turn the ideal into um, what do I want to call it? A mask? Like you're going to clothe yourself into the vision and you become a pretense rather than a real person, like a paper doll version of yourself. Does that make sense? So one of the dangers of being really idealistic and hello, meet me, I am the president of that club, is that you can use the ideal, the illusion, as a way of masking pain that needs to be addressed, the real that needs to be faced. So if you tend towards idealism like I do, you have to seek out some realists in your life, some pragmatists to help you see what's actually happening so that you don't just keep clothing yourself in pretense. This is why I'm such a fan of telling the truth, telling the freaking truth. And I don't mean telling it, broadcasting it all over the internet. That's not what I'm talking about. I don't even mean telling it to your children or your husband or your mother. I'm talking about telling it to yourself. <laughs> Tell the freaking truth to yourself. Don't pretend. So if you have a child who's so busy on the internet all day every day and playing video games and you have this ideal that homeschoolers should never interfere with internet play but secretly you really resent it but you're going to keep pretending that it's not bothering you guess what's happening to your relationship with your child you are now damaging that relationship because when you pretend you are not being truthful and it damages intimacy. You can't be intimate and pretend at the same time. So at some point, this stockpile of pretending to be okay with it 
is going to blow. Because the truth is, even though you want to believe those beliefs, they aren't yours yet. So how do you get there? What if the ideal is attractive to you and you believe it on some level, but you've got all this baggage or you've got all this uncomfortableness? Well, you start with the freaking truth. You say to yourself, I am a split person. I have this ideal over here. I really, 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 really don't want to interfere with video gameplay. And then I have this other person over here who's really, 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 really nervous about brain damage from video gameplay. And then you own that. And so right now, you might not be able to live this liberated version of that ideal that all your friends seem to be living until you've really come to terms. So now you've got to come to terms. You've got to start reading, playing, conversing, and doing the hard work of creating your very own position. And it's hard work. And it's a life in process. And it isn't something you just arrive at after reading an article or hanging out with a few people. You have to do the hard work of developing a unique point of view that is all your own, that you can live up to honestly. And it doesn't mean that it's all for all time. It's just for this time. You can be as honest as possible. You could say to a child, I've read so many parents who are great at just saying, you can play games as much as you want. And I'm this divided person right now. Part of me really wants to indulge that, and part of me is terrified that you're, that's all you'll ever do. Can we just talk about this? How do you feel about it? How do you feel about the idea that this is possible and my feelings about it over here? Have the conversation. Start to create space for some communication and movement. Idealism does not allow movement. It makes you smaller. It makes you hold back. It makes you ignore the dark side. Um, there's a quote who I don't know it, who it's attributed to, but it's um, but I've quoted it so many times online that now people think it's my quote, <laughs> and it's not. Uh, but the quote is this: "You can't cheat the dark gods. You can't cheat the dark gods." Think about that a little bit. You can't cheat the dark gods. So if your insides are not congruent with what you say on the outside, it's going to come out. It's going to squirt out. It's going to come out. You can't cheat it. That's what family dysfunction is. It's pretending to be one way and secretly having all these other thoughts over here that are totally being experienced in the whole room. <laughs> you think it's disguised. Uh, it's not. Cheryl Strayed, forgiveness doesn't sit there like a pretty boy in a bar. Forgiveness is the old fat guy you have to haul up a hill. <laughs> She's a great writer. Oh. Molly says, one of the most healing things for me was accepting how I was feeling in that moment and letting go of my expectation of how I should be feeling. Should is a heavy, is heavy baggage. Yes. Um, another writer that I have enjoyed in the past year uh, is someone who's a dating coach, of course, not this year, but like five years ago, named Rory Ray. And she talks about, for women, that we carry a lot of our um, emotional idealism in the way we hold our bodies, you know, we're sucking in our tummies and we're holding our shoulders back and we're always trying to manage how we look and feel. And so she suggests, and I really love this, just let go, let your stomach stick out, <laughs> like let go of your posture. That's where you can start to find out what's true because you hold it all in your body, in your shoulders, in your jaw. I grind my teeth. I suck in my stomach. Like, don't we all do that? So think about just sort of like letting go and seeing what's there in relief against this idealism. So again, going 40 minutes, this is such a big topic though. And honestly, as I've shared many times, I'm not a therapist. I'm not a trained psychologist. I am giving you sort of Julie's 30,000 foot aerial view of life in her 50s, right? Based on the things I've been through, the therapy I've done, the books I've read, the years I've invested in homeschooling. So let me at least say this. Your mileage will vary. You are going to come to your own insights. Really all I'm about is being a permission giver anyway. Go after your ideals. I'm not telling you to never have an ideal. What I'm saying is don't be bound by your idealism. Those are two different things. You can have an ideal. Don't be bound by it. 
Leave some navigating room. You know, be in a skiff, not a Titanic. Allow yourself to shift and move around the icebergs. Don't just build this massive boat and then crash. That's a horrible feeling, <laughs> one ideal at a time. We tend to like stack them up like Jenga blocks and then you start pulling them out a little bit and pretty soon the whole house crashes. You don't want that. My husband has stayed around listening saying, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that idea made me gasp. Wow, cool. One of them, oh, okay, cool. We, I read that one already. I just want to make sure there's nothing else to read. Um, someone is asking me, sorry, off the subject, but I've been thinking about this all day. Your teaching philosophy of reading, discuss, read, discuss has been amazing in helping my daughter. Uh, oh, your brave little writers blossom. My daughter reads an insane amount of fantasy, and I can see the fruits in her reading and writing. Oh, that's so beautiful. However, I'm struggling to find nonfiction writing for her to read that has the same benefits. Well, it takes time. Nonfiction is less interesting to small children who love fantasy because she's right now living in that world. But she's got all her years, all her years. So if fantasy is lighting her up right now, do that and then wait and find an opportunity with nonfiction. Where I would probably start is reading nonfiction about the authors of her favorite fantasy books, reading about how they craft fantasy, reading about the mythological elements of fantasy, do the pieces of fantasy that draw her imagination and look at the nonfiction representations of those. That's what I would do. Okay, <laughs> that was a funny thing to tack on at the end of this, but I love answering questions live, so at least we've done that. I'm gonna let this be the end. So thank you tonight for sharing with me I will be back first thing in the morning, so you'll barely sleep, and then here my little face will be again. <laughs> so I'll see you at 8 in the morning. Let's see what tomorrow's reading is. We are now officially halfway through A Gracious Space. Oh, tomorrow's is great. It's the antidote to disillusionment. I'm so excited. I'm not even going to tell you. And if you don't have my book yet, you can still buy it. We are also ramping up for winter, so you can start buying Winter Gracious Space 2 if you want. That's on Amazon as well. Uh, and that is actually of my three. I think it's my favorite one. It's a little longer. It's really good. And so we'll be reading that too. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. So let's close. Live honestly. Write bravely. And defend the disillusioned. I love you. Have a great night.